Okay, so uh, on Tuesday, we talk about uh, pinhole cameras. Remember, we have a dark chamber, a box, uh, on which we just make a very, very tiny, very, very minuscule pinhole that allows light to come in. We put film on the other end of the box, and then that light gets imprinted on the film, right? and that way we create an image. Now, of course, that's the original camera. These days we don't have film. We have CCDs, right? CCD is nothing else than a matrix, an actual matrix, that for an instant of time at each cell in that matrix counts how many photons reach that cell. And depending on the number of photons that reach that cell, the brightness or the luminance on that pixel is higher or lower, right? That's simple. All right. Great. So why lenses then? Anyone can tell me why cameras have lenses? I mean, we've already established that you, all you need is a box, right? And a box doesn't have to be a you know big box it can be a very tiny tiny box like cameras are these days right in which end at one end we put the ccd the other end we just make a pinhole and we're done right problem solved but surprisingly cameras have lenses why what do you think that is yes the back to bend the light uh, that's true. That's what lenses do. That's correct. But my question is, why do you need to do that? To collect the light. To collect the light. Can you elaborate on that? Um, uh, to let uh, more light uh, into the chamber. That's very good. To get more light into the chamber. Okay. Um, very close. Very good. So here's the problem. If I have a camera like this, a box, and I have my CCD here at the back, and now I make a very tiny pinhole right here in the front, right? And what I have, obviously, is an object that's illuminated somehow. So let's see, I have, say, my three-dimensional object, and I have my light source, right? Some light source here. And then what happens is that that light source sends a light ray, or several, obviously, but one of them to that object that bounces back in multiple directions, and in one of these directions, actually happens to go through the pinhole and then into the camera and that's what we see in the image that we get, right? All right, so that's fantastic. The problem is that if I make these pinholes that small, the amount of light that is going to get in the camera is super tiny, <laughs> right? So uh, pictures at the end, right? So early on, they didn't have CCDs, obviously. They had film here. And film requires some time or some amount of light to actually have time to imprint the image, right? So if the hole is that small, there's not enough light coming in to actually imprint an image. So you're left with um, basically nothing. And if you look at the original images of photography, they're really dark, right? And the reason is, well, because there was very little light coming in. <laughs> um, but that has an easy solution that does not require lenses. What's the solution? That's right. Make the pinhole larger, right? I mean, <laughs> duh. <laughs> uh, all right, so instead of a pinhole, we're going to make a bigger hole. That's it, right? Or is it? What's the problem with this solution? What's that? Diffused? Uh, is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, that's correct. Why? Mm, because the light uh, projected to a uh, different point. And, uh, Very good. 
The answer was because lights from different points in the object will converge to the same area, or the same point will project to uh, different points in the image plane, right? So look at this. Okay, right here. So what I'm doing here, I'm doing a cone. Do you see that cone that I tried to draw here? That cone is all these pixels in my image, right, or this area in my film, are going to have information of the same three-dimensional point. Whoops. Which means, said another way, that in each position in the film or in each pixel in a digital camera is going to have information from multiple points in the world, right? And then what are we going to get? We're going to get blurred images. They're going to look terrible. <laughs> so what do we want? We want the pinhole to be truly small so that images are sharp. And we want to be the pinhole really large so we have enough light. Well, something's got to give. The solution is lenses. What we're going to do is we're going to have the pinhole large, right? But then we're going to put a lens in, fr in front that refracts, bends the light, as was mentioned earlier, right? Bends the light in a way that it points, it, it points all these 3D world points into a single image point, right? And that way we get both of, of the best of both, both worlds. Sharp image and enough light, right? Now, even with that, original photography obviously had many problems. So lenses is only part of the solution. Today's technology is so much more advanced and does, uh, gets really complicated. And we're not going to cover this in this course. There is a course here at Ohio State on photogrammetry that they may cover this. Um, but here, we're just going to see the very basics. Okay. So in original photography, if you ever go uh, see uh, pictures taken, photos taken in the early ages of photography in the late 19th century, which I encourage you to do whenever there is a museum that has an exhibition. Look for pictures where there are children, because those are the most interesting ones. So what happens was that even with the lenses that could be manufactured at that time, I mean, think about the lenses that we have in a cell phone right now, right? I mean, these are true engineer marvel. But the lenses that existed back in the day were really basic. And with those lenses, you needed about probably a couple minutes, three minutes, to actually create a picture that was of sufficient quality to be displayed, right? Now, um, I don't know if you have had children. <laughs> uh, probably not. But if you know someone who does, uh, Making a kid steal for two, three minutes is mission impossible, right? So literally, this is no joke. The solution that people found was to nail children onto a piece of wood and stick them in front of the camera. So what it's funny about this is that you see in old pictures, you see the children pretty much stable or, uh, you know, not too blurry. Uh, they probably can move their arms a little and they get a little blurry, but not too much. But the eyes, look at the eyes. The eyes are completely blurred. <laughs> There's just no way they're going to stick their fixate or they're going to fixate in one location for long enough to create that picture, right? Their parents, they look fine, but the children, it's just it's completely, it's very funny. Um, now, um, Obviously, we'd probably consider this child abuse now, but um, that's what they did back in the late 19th century to solve this problem. All right. Um, OK, so that's the reason why we need lenses. To derive the basic equa equations for lenses, I'm going to use the three laws of geometric optics. which are the following. Number one, we are going to assume, and believe me, this is a big assumption, but we just have to make assumptions, as I said, on day one, right? We're going to assume that light, 
light travels in a straight line, okay? Which in general we're going to refer to as light rays, right? So we're going to assume that my light source is right there and my object is right here. There's a straight line that connects the two, period. <laughs> okay, so there are these um, light rays that travel in straight lines. Number two, a light ray, its, uh, its reflect, uh, reflection on a given surface and the surface normal are coplanar. So again, if I have a surface here, I have the surface normal right here, right? This is the normal of my surface. And I have an incoming light ray say in this direction, call it R1, and I have the output one, R2, then these three vectors, R1, R2, and N, are coplanar, right? They are on a plane, They're on a two-dimensional plane, even though I live in 3D world. And number three, this is called Snell's Law. We're going to say that when a ray moves from a medium with index of refraction N1 to another medium with a different index of refraction, let's say N2, then the following equation holds N1 times the sine of alpha 1, it's equal to N2, the sine of alpha 2, where I have the normal of my surface of the medium right here same as I had in here. I have R1 that's coming in, and I have R2 that's coming now into this different medium, right? So for example, this different medium could be water, could be glass, could be variety of things, right? And alpha one is the angle between the normal and the incoming ray, R1, that should be R1, not R2. And R2, okay, let me do this to make it easier. R2 defines alpha 2, the angle between the vector that defines the direction of the normal and R2. Now N1 and N2 is the index of refraction or the refractive index. Which is defined as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum over the speed of light in that specific medium. Okay? So the speed of light in vacuum versus the speed of light in that particular medium. Now for most of our purposes, we're going to assume that we live in vacuum, and thank goodness we don't, otherwise we'll all be dead, but we're gonna assume that, so the index of refraction of vacuum would be one, right? So we're gonna assume that air, which is a good approximation, and inside a lens it's usually vacuum anyways, um, and that index of refraction is one. Now, I'm going to talk uh, about lenses here, that's why I use these equations. That does not apply to mirrors. Mirrors are completely different than lenses, okay? Let's not confuse the two, it's a common confusion. So let's make sure that we 
understand that. We are going to derive today the first order uh, geometric optics equations for lenses. Uh, there are higher order definitions that obviously get more accurate as you go higher in order, but this is just too much for computer vision. In fact, mo um, or image processing, most of image processing, not all obviously, that's why we covered this, but most of image processing does not use lenses for the simple reason that you end up with nonlinear equations that are difficult to work with, but they're useful to know because in some cases they do apply. Okay, so the first order uh, model, it's called the paraxial model. And to understand this, let's work with um, the surface of a lens, okay? So to do that, let me draw the lens. So you're gonna start with, say, this, okay. I could have done it better but probably not worse. Okay, that's a little better. Okay, so this is the surface of my lens, the outer surface, okay, which I have approximated with a portion, a segment of a circle, okay? And the center of the circle is probably, say, right here, okay? That's my center of the circle in which I could draw the entire S1. Okay, good. Now, this remember for the camera corresponds to the K direction, the K basis vector or the Z direction, right? Remember that from the first lecture? All right. And now if I take any point here, here on the surface of the lens and I draw, whoops, okay, and here, <laughs> and I draw this vector that connects C with that point, then I can I can draw the resulting triangle that I obtain. This is this triangle right here, okay? And this triangle has a height, h, and an angle here I'm gonna call gamma. And now note that if I copy that line, that center line over here, right, parallel to this one, that crosses though this point where that vector C, P, let's say, crosses the lens, right? So these two lines now, these two lines are now parallel. Then I end up with a second triangle, right? This triangle right here. That is identical to the first one, meaning that this angle is also gamma, right? And the height obviously is H, right? Same thing. And obviously the same would apply here Right? That angle is still the same one, right? Okay. I'm also going to define the radius, obviously, of that circle as R, R the radius. And now we can use this knowledge to see what happens to a ray of light when it hits the surface of the lens and it gets bent into the camera, okay? So let's do that. All right. That's my Z direction, my Z direction defined by the K vector as before. 
I'm going to start with the segment of the circle that defines the surface of the lens. And now I'm going to select a three-dimensional point outside the camera. So this is the world, and this is the inside of the camera. Okay. So I'm going to start with a point, say here, P1. Okay. Now this point is there is a light ray from this point that travels toward the lens and hits the lens at some point capital P. And here, as before, I can draw a line that's parallel to the center line, right, that I have. And now, when this light ray hits that surface of the lens, it gets bended, right, it bends, and it goes toward the inside of the camera and it hits or it passes rather through that center line say at some point P2 okay and it continues right so far so good all right now remember that we still have our center of the circle that we call C here somewhere right so it's probably too close, <coughs> maybe more like here, right? Okay, good, better. And now we have these two lines connecting that has this angle gamma, right? and passes through that point and continues in this direction. Okay, I have, let's see, I'm gonna name this angle here and that angle here beta one and beta two. I'm gonna call this R1 and this one R2. Yep. So far, so good. We are going to call then these two angles here, beta 1 and beta 2 again, because this triangle and that triangle are the same. This triangle and that triangle are the same. So they have to have the same angle, right? And I'm going to call this angle right here between these two vectors. This I'm going to call alpha 2, okay? And this one here between these two vectors, alpha 1. And remember we called this distance from here to here h. That's the height. And now I'm going to also, from this center line, now the center line that I have here is the line defined where I have that point capital P, right? So I have the distance from here to P1. Let me call this D1. And from here to P2, I'll call this D2. All right, I think I have all I need. Okay, so let's see. Gam question? <coughs> no? Okay. Thought I heard the question. Now, gamma, notice that I can write it as equal the sum of two vectors right there, right? Which are alpha 2 plus beta 2, right? Correct? Or if I go to this other side, gamma is equal to alpha 1, which is this big one, minus beta 1, right? Okay, good. 
Excellent. All right, so have a, an equation already. We're getting somewhere. All right, next we're going to make a bold assumption. Uh, that's why this is first order. <laughs> and we're going to assume that these angles that we have are all very small, okay? So all the angles that we have defined are assumed to be small. That's going to simplify equations tremendously. If the angles are small, then sine of gamma, remember that I need this to compute Snell's law, is approximately gamma, very good, which is approximately h, or it's actually uh, pretty much the same, or the approximate to the sine of h over r, right? Right? Okay, good. And you can repeat the same thing for all the other values. So beta 1 uh, is approximately h over d1 here, right? Beta 1 h over d1. Mm, beta 2 is approximately h over d2. And therefore, now we can compute say using this equation here that we started with and copy it alpha 1 as gamma plus beta 1 which is equal to h or approximately because obviously these are approximations h times 1 over r plus 1 over d1 and alpha 2 would be approximately h1 over r minus 1 over d2, right? Yeah? You all see this? Oh, gosh. Do you all see this? I wish I could remove this. I just can't. <laughs> I'll try not to write down there. Um, let me know if you have problems seeing something. All right, so now that we have all our angles, we can come here and use the Snell's law, right? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to use N1, the sine of alpha 1. <coughs> alpha 1, uh, let's see, alpha 1, I have it here. It's this equation. So it's um, HR <coughs> times 1 plus R D1. And that should be equal to N2 times the sine of alpha 2, which is 1 minus, excuse me, H over R times 1 minus R over D2, correct? I can cancel these two terms. And I have then N1 plus N1 r over d1 it's equal to n2 minus n1 r over d2 so far so good yeah good and now let me work this a little more so i'm going to add r here so if n1 r d1 plus uh, let's see, N2, whoops, oh yeah, N2 R D2 equals N2 minus N1, okay, right? Yep, good. And now I can finally say N1 divided by D1 plus N2 divided by D2 is equal to N2 minus N1 divided by R, right? All right, excellent. Very good. This is the paraxial refraction 
equation that is used to derive lenses or to model lenses. And that's the one that I'm going to use next to work on the lenses that we have defined here. Okay. All right, so far so good. Any questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I think the last term is should be... This okay. one? Yes, the last term should oh. be M2. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 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 M3 is the last term. Right? So what's that? Right. Oh, it's uh, here? Here. Yeah. N1. N1. There is a one. Right. The last one is N2. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're right. My bad. This one, right? N2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So it's N2 minus N2 R D2. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And this is N1 times N1 R over D1. Yes. Very good. All right. So now let's define a lens. And we're going to make yet another assumption. We haven't made enough assumptions yet, right? <laughs> We're going to assume that the lenses are thin, really thin, in fact. So thin that the surface of the outer edge of the lens and the surface of the inner edge of the lens are in the same spatial location, <laughs> okay? They're one and the same, right? They're that thin. And we're going to have to have that assumption because otherwise this is what happens. What happens in a real lens is, is a real lens. A light ray comes in, gets refracted, then travels within the lens for some period of time, and then gets refracted yet again, right? We're going to ignore that this happens, this in between. That's what thin lens means, right? Let's assume that that doesn't exist. Okay, that, that way we avoid tr having to solve a lot of problems. We are also, so we're gonna have a really thin light, really, really thin. We're also going to assume that we have air on both sides, inside and outside the camera. and usually vacuum inside the lens. Okay, that means that our index of refraction, as I said, for air is approximately one. I think the real index of refraction of air is like 0.99 something. So, you know, one. <laughs> Engineers like to work within an order of magnitude, so. One is a really good approximation here. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. Um, we're going to use this result that they have right here. And I need to apply now this result twice, right? First, for the outer layer of the lens. And then second, for the inner layer of the lens, right? OK. So let's do that. So the first one looks like this. I have a point P0. That from which uh, the light rate is coming, which hits that point P on the surface of the lens, right? That point P here. and. Now this is going to be refracted, and it will cross that midline point at say P1, okay, right here. We have the center of the lens, which is our pinhole, which remember is where the origin is, the zero zero, or origin of our coordinate system is. And we're going to define, since this is the z direction, we're going to say that the distance 
from here to here is a Z0, right? And I have to add a negative sign, remember, because this is in the negative side of the pinhole. And this one is going to be Z1. OK? All right, good. We are then going to apply our equation. And let's call this index of refraction inside the lens n, whatever it is. So I'm going to apply my equation I have right here. n1 is 1, because that we assume it's uh, air or vacuum. So this is 1. So I have 1 over d1. What was d1? This one right here, which is z0 negative plus what do I have the second one is n2 say so n2 we call it n whatever the index of refraction of our lens is divided by d2 which is now z1 and this is equal to let's see we have n2 minus n1 which is n minus 1 right divided by the radius r all right Great. So far, so good. OK, so now we have already computed what happens when the light ray comes in, hits the outer side of the lens, bends, and crosses the midline inside the camera, right? Or inside the lens. Now we have to add the second one. which goes like this, right? And to do that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to compute now, in that case, remember, whoops, sorry. In this case, remember, I was going in this direction from P0 to P, and then from P1. Now I'm going to invert this, right? Now I'm going from P1 to P in this direction, right? And then I'm going to hit the lens in this direction, and I'm going to refract back in this direction here. And I'm going to get P0 prime, which is the corresponding point inside the camera of the 3D wall point P0, OK? And if you will, you can consider this as this one inside here on this side, if you prefer, right? So this one comes in and refracts, and it goes in this direction, which is making the mirror image of that, right? OK. Great. So if I have this, now I can write the equation of the second one here, right? Let me do it in red. To indicate that this is the second one. So I'm going to have again n because now I have the index of refraction n1 is I'm n within the lens. So I have n divided by this distance, right, which is going to be z1 negative plus 1 over z0 prime. z0 prime is obviously going to be that distance here, right? Oops, rather this way, right? For P0, right? And that's equal to 1 minus n over r negative, right? Now, note that I added the negative and negative here because I'm computing the mirror image, right? So now this is positive and this is negative, and therefore this r, the radius, is also negative. All right, so I have my two equations. I just have to put them together, and I'm done. Let's do that. Oh. 
All right. Great. So P0 prime is the image point of P0, right? So P0 prime is the, let's call it image point of P0. And therefore, we can say that P0, this P0, crosses the midline of the camera at P0 prime, right? So if I locate my image plane at that distance from the center of the length, then that point is going to be focused, right? It's going to be sharp, OK? So this can be calculated by adding these two equations that we have. So let's rewrite them. The first one is 1 minus z0 plus n over z1 minus the second one, which is n over z1 plus 1 over z0 prime equals 2n minus 1 over r. And these two cancel out. So I have 1 over z0 prime minus 1 over z0. It's equal to 1 over f, where f is equal to r over 2n minus 1. Now, why did I call this f? Anyone? Because that's the focal length, right? The way I define the focal length with lenses is by knowing the radius and the index of refraction, right? Because that is the point where once I have all the light rays coming from here, from that, from that point, if I now draw the second one here, right? It hits this other point, but it's coming from P02. And then that comes here, and then comes here, and then it comes whoops, back here at the exact same point. Right? So in fact, every light ray that will cross through the two lenses will converge to P0 prime. And therefore, we have solved the original problem, which is what happens when we have a larger pinhole and we have a lot of light rays coming in from the same 3D world point, but not registering, not being registered in the exact same image point. Now they are. But they only are at this if my image plane is located at this distance f from the center of the lens, the pinhole. Right? If I move this backward or forward, right, I move it here or I move it here, what happens? That this point becomes blurred, right? And what happens with lenses when you move a lens, right, with a focus in and out? What happens is that you can get unblurred points of the same distance, but not unblurred points of all right? So if I go now away from the camera and I take another point here, Q0, I'm going to get a Q0 prime that is at a different distance, different focal length from the center of the lens, right? So there's no way for me to have sharp view of all the objects in the world, right? There are tricks, but uh, not with this model, right? To have sharp view of all the points in 3D, only the points are at the same distance from the camera, right? Okay. Good. All right. Um, now we can extend this to work with um, any arbitrary points. Now my selection of points here was um, really specific. I only selected points that are on this central line, right, of the lens. Now consider that you want to work with points that are not in the central line. That actually uh, is not complicated from what we have. 
that's a straightforward extension. Let's see that. So I have my lens here, my center line, and now instead of a point P0 here, right, and a point, whoops, okay. And a point P here, or let's call this Q, I'm going to select a point right here, right? So that's my three-dimensional point, right? But that has an easy solution because, yes, this point is going to cross that lens, the outer edge of the lens at point Q. But if I continue in that opposite direction, this is going to be my point P0 that I have already defined. Right? So that's very simple to do. Then I'm going to do the same thing here. This is going to cross at P0 prime, right? And then to find where in the image that point P is focused, I need to do another light ray. I could select, say, this one to point R, and then here, and where they cross, that's where this is going to be focused. Or I could select a very specific, very simple case, which is the one that passes through the pinhole, right? The center of the lens. I'll do that. And they converge, say, here. And that's my point P prime. See that? OK. So I'm not going to do that. You have in this slides the repetition of, so you have, to, you have these two solutions here, right, using this equation. And you just have to put everything together. This is really long to do. It's not worth it. It's in the paper. I mean, it's not worth it to do it here in the, on the board. But you have it also in the slides. And then if you do that, you end up with this equation, 1 over z prime, which is the distance from the center of the pinhole to p prime, right? Minus 1 over z, which is the distance to the original point p from the center of the pinhole to p, right? It's equal to 1 over f, right? All right, and that's the equation that you will work with if you want to work with lenses. That's called also the lens maker equation because that's what lens makers used to use to design lenses, right? Not anymore, obviously, they have much, much more sophisticated equations that you can work with these days because we have computers that can do all the calculations for us. But back in the day when they didn't. They had to work with very simple models. All right. Um, any questions about this? Now note that a point P, say located at the distance Z from the pinhole, or say Z negative, right? Because it's a negative side um, from the pinhole, is only focused when the image plane is located at the z, the corresponding z prime distance from the origin. Now, all possible rays coming from P will interact, uh, intersect, excuse me, at that point, and that's where the image is going to be sharpest. However, there are a specific cases in which you can get points focused that are, uh, they're, they're not like this, that, or that applies to every possible point, basically, or almost every possible point in the world. Can anyone tell me in which particular case that occurs? This, there's an unrealistic, give you a hint, there's an unrealistic case, but in practice, it's a very good approximation. What would I need to do here, right? Where do I need to put that point P to simplify this equation, right? So
such that z prime it's always equal to f infinity right if I put that point at infinity at an infinite distance from the center of the camera right the pinhole then this is infinite this is zero z prime is equal to f problem solved <laughs> right the point is always at focused and that's what cameras usually use as a trick right for things that are really far away from you there is a setting you say okay a landscape setting right and then everything seems to be on focus. I'm like, like, well, how did that happen? Well, things are just so far away that you divide for such a, by such a number that it really doesn't matter anymore, right? Everything seems to be sharp and crisp, even though maybe the distances between one mountain and another is very large, the distance from these mountains to use is still much, much larger, right? So we have solved the problem. So that's a very particular case. Uh, that's worth mentioning. So, um, in other words, I guess that you could say um, this is a, an interesting way to redefine the focal length. You could say that the focal length of a camera is nothing else than the place where objects that are really far from you focus. Right? So, basically, points at infinity focus at the focal length. That's another way to interpret focal length. Now the depth of field of a camera or the depth of focus that you may see in cameras is the range of distances that modern cameras have where points are in focus, right? So right now in really good cameras you'll see uh, a parameter that's this uh, depth of field or depth of focus that will allow you to focus points in the 3D world are at a certain distance, right, from one another. And this is because of the sophistication of the uh, lenses that are, are produced these days and the cameras. Okay. Great. Wonderful. So unless there are any questions, I'm going to move on uh, and uh, start defining uh, cameras more, a little more um, formally. No questions? All right, so let me do that. So now we have seen all the basics about cameras and lenses. Now I just want to use all this to start deriving algorithms for image processing. But before I do that, I actually need to define these things a little bit more formally and define a technique that we'll be using for the first two-thirds of the course that hopefully if anything if you learn anything in that course that will be the technique that you that you learn that's very useful all right this is um, generally called geometric camera models um, which is basically what we've been doing but informally and uh, these models are the ones that we're going to be using to derive these uh, methods that, that I was talking about. Let me start by talking about the Euclidean space. Now, I know this sounds very basic, but bear with me, okay? Things have sometimes seem too basic and they are not, right? Okay? Good. Now, a 3D Euclidean space, let's call it E3, right? This is a three-dimensional Euclidean space. is given by the origin O and three orthogonal vectors. They're obviously called the basis vectors, right, of norm or length one. I'm going to call these basis vectors, these base orthonormal vectors, I, J, and K. And I'm going to copy their norm, and the norm has to be equal to one. And you can draw this in a three-dimensional space like this, 
where you have, say, i, j, and k, like that. These vectors are orthogonal to one another. And at the center of my space, I have my origin, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Yes? So far, so good. OK. We call this the orthogonal coordinate frame F. I call this F. It's the, um, what do you say, orthogonal uh, coordinate frame F. OK. So now, given this three-dimensional space, I'm going to define a vector from O to P. Okay, so this is my vector OP, OP vector, right? Note that I added vector, the OP vector. Now, what's this OP vector? Well, remember that I have, this is I, J, and K, right? The three basis vectors that I define. So the first thing I can do is project OP onto I, J, and K, right? So if I do this, I'm going to get three numbers, right? I'm going to get X, Y, and Z, three numbers, right? This is the projection of OP projected onto i, j, and k. So again, op, say I project this onto the vector i, right? So this is a simple inner product. That is going to give me the value x. op projected onto j is going to give me a number y. And op projected onto k is going to give me a number, oops, z. OK? All right. Now, that means that I can write OP as follows. X times I plus Y times J plus Z times K. Right? And that's what the vector OP is written like, right? Like this, right? So I could be, for example, in 3D space, could be 1, 0, 0. J could be 0, 1, 0. And K, 0, 0, 1, right? Now, this is not usually the notation that you'll see or the notation I'll use, right? I will rather use that other notation. P, it's equal to X, Y, Z, or X, Y, Z transpose, right? That's what I'm going to use. Now, this is just a standard way of writing these vectors that we, the community, have agreed that is more convenient because it's simpler than this one, right? But this is the real one. And it will become apparent uh, very soon why this is so, right? Because that means that I know i, j, and k. Here, it means that I have to know them as well, right? They haven't disappeared, although I'm not writing them. I have to know what the origin is, what i, j, and k are. Otherwise, I have no idea what this p represents, right? OK. So we're going to say that this p is given in our frame of reference, F, that we have defined. OK, so now let's use this to define a plane. How are we going to define a plane? OK, what's the time? Uh, we still have 20 minutes. Good.
All right. Um, so in the same way that I have defined this standard notation for a vector p, I can define a standard notation for a plane, right? Not for a vector, OP, but for an actual plane, right? In 3D space, deal. So a plane is, um, let's call it a plane capital Pi. It's given by a vector, a norm vector. Let's call it N. Okay. Now, imagine that I have this plane right here. Right? This is a two-dimensional plane in 3D space, and it's given by the normal vector that's orthogonal to that plane, N. Right? That's all I need. Right? I need to know what the origin is as well, obviously. I'll get to that in a second. If I have F here, my frame of reference, that F has an origin, right? And therefore, actually, let me do this because otherwise it's going to be really weird. And I have my OP vector here, where P is this, and this is the norm of the plane. Okay? Yep. Good. That looks a little better. So, how are we going to define this? Well, I can define any point A in pi, so I'm going to have A and P obviously are in my plane, and therefore I can say that AP times N, the norm of the, the plane, is equal to anyone? Zero, right? The orthogonal. Okay. Now, P is obviously given by X, Y, and Z. It's the three-dimensional coordinates of my point P in my frame of reference F. And N are the corresponding A, B, C values of the normal, right? <coughs> I need one more thing, which is the distance of the plane to the origin. And that's obviously defined by the distance from this to some point in my plane, right? So I can call this, say, OA times N. I can project this onto N, right? So if I have any vector this is A, this is OA vector, right? This vector right here. And then I project this onto the dimension of N, and that tells me how far away that is from the origin. Okay? All right, so let's see. We can write now that if I have OP vector N, right? This is OP vector N minus OA vector N, that should be equal to zero. This is the same, note this, this is the same as saying that start with AP, right? AP is the vector that connects A and P here on my plane pi. This is equal to OP minus OA. 
right? This is the same as OP minus OA, right? Same thing. And that means that I can write OP vector minus OA vector times N equals zero, right? Because OA, uh, excuse me, AP is a vector that's orthogonal to N by definition, right? And it's a normal, the normal vector of the plane, and o, o, uh, AP is a vector on the plane. So they have to be orthogonal to one another. Right, so this is zero. Good. All right. So, since remember OP, where do I have this? OP is given as X, Y, and Z, right? So I can write X, Y, and Z times N, which is A, B, C, this has to be equal to zero, right? Same thing. Okay. And from here, let's write this down. This is AX plus BY plus CZ equals zero, right? This is the equation of a plane. I'm just missing one more thing, which is the offset, right? of the plane. So now I'm going to add the second component here, OA n equals zero. And what did I call this before? D, right? So minus D equals zero. And that's our famous equation of a plane, right? And just derived the famous equation of a plane that you all know. So every point P with values x, y, and z that satisfy this equation is a point on the plane, right? Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing I did here. Uh, uh, these derivations are clear, right? Yeah, okay. Now I'm gonna do the same thing that seemed obvious here, right? That we're saying, oh, this is the real definition, but this is how we're going to write it, right? I'm going to do the same thing right there. So the way I'm going to write this, I don't want to write AX plus BY plus ZZ minus D. I mean, I know that X, Y, and Z exist, right? These are points on the plane. I don't need to know that. What I want is A, B, C, and minus D. That's what I really want. Okay. Now note that if I multiply this by x, y, z1, this has to be equal to zero, right? And this first part here corresponds to what? The definition of my plane. And this second part here corresponds to the definition of my point P, right? Or does it? Isn't that a weird definition of a point P? That's not the same definition I had here. Oops, what happened? <laughs> I added the fourth dimension, yeah. I added the one at the end, right? Interesting. Um, this is called homogeneous or homogeneous, some people call it. At true name, I think it's homogeneous. Homogeneous coordinates. Now, we are going to work for the remainder of the course with homogeneous coordinates a lot. <laughs> Right? I mean, this is the normal type of vectors that we're going to work with. Now, homogeneous coordinates allows us to work in projective space, which is one of the, mo the coolest, but probably most difficult things to understand. So don't panic. 
we're not going to talk about the projective space here. If you take computer vision, you will. <laughs> we talk quite a bit about the projective space, um, which is very important, very useful, fantastic, amazing um, space to work with. But we are going to work with homogeneous coordinates here. And we need to understand at least the very basics of, of what that means. All right, for now, let me say this. For now, just know one thing. To go from non-homogeneous coordinates to homogeneous coordinates, you add a one at the end. You add an extra dimension whose value is a one. Okay? Right? So far, so good? Now, what happens if you go back to non-homogeneous. So you have a homogeneous coordinate system and you want to go back to the non-homogeneous. What you do is you divide the first p minus one dimensions by the last one. In our case, we're dividing by one, so we just end up with x, y, and z, right? But in the projective space, the number at the end can change. And there is a very particular number, don't write this down, you'll see that in computer vision if you take that course next year, but there's a very specific number that we can put here that is super cool. Which one is that? Zero. Zero. Very good. What happens when I go back to non-homogeneous coordinates? What's that? I have infinite, infinite, infinite. Those are the points at infinity. That actually defines the line at infinity. Remember that we talk about the line at infinity when we were talking about the horizon? Remember the horizon line? That's the line at infinity. So when you actually have an image that has a horizon, you can go physically there and say, this is my line at infinity, which means all the points here, are x, y, z, zero. And from there, you can use a projective space to recover the 3D structure of the world. Isn't that cool? The, in fact, points at infinity can be whatever you want, right? You just have to say, that line right here is my line at infinity. There's no place on, in the universe that is better suited for the line at infinity. It's just a place, right? And that's what the horizon really is. It's the line at infinity in the projective space. So if you're interested about this, hopefully you are, take computer vision and you'll see all about this. This is really cool. All right, so that basically has allowed us to write planes, these homogeneous coordinates as pi, right? Our definition of the plane, and this is the same as our standard way of describing vectors times p, the vector in homogeneous coordinates, right? And that's our equation of a plane. Now, let's look at this equation for a second and tell me what I have lost by using homogeneous coordinates and ending up with that equation. There's one problem when we use homogeneous coordinates, which we're going to use all the time, as I said, there's one particular thing that we are losing. We're giving it up. What is it? For those of you that were in my machine learning class earlier, could probably provide a good answer because we saw the same problem. What's that? Scale. scale, what do you mean by scale? Yeah, you're right, but what do you mean by scale? <laughs> Come on, give it a shot. It means that I can do what in that equation? I can multiply this equation by any scalar on both sides 
and still holds. But on this side, nothing's changed, right? <laughs> so our solution, we're going to say all the solutions that we get from this method are, or with the coordinate system, are up to scale. So it means that I will be able to recover 3D structure even from 2D images, but I will not know at which scale things are. I have no idea. Because if I multiply that plane that I have there, pi, by a scalar, or my point, p, x, y, and z, by a scalar, I still get the same result. Right? So I can never know the size when I work, or the scale, rather, when I work with um, homogeneous coordinates. All right, one more. Oh, I'm out of time. OK. We'll do uh, spheres and quad quadrics uh, when we come back. Remember, I'll post this in Carmen. No class next week. All right, have a good week. <laughs>